So I haven't had this much fun in a movie theater since I saw Kung Fu Hustle back in like 2004, which is like uh, a similarly just like incredibly high energy, incredibly just fun film to watch. To understand geopolitics, you must have the freedom to be honest. The More Freedom Foundation podcast. Hello, Rob. How are you? Not bad. How are you doing yourself, Rory? Yeah, yeah. Struggling on, struggling on. So, what have you been up to this week? You know, not a ton. Not a ton. Been diving in on Yemen a bit. Been trying to write this book on uh, American Empire, which involves a a lot of uh, looking into... Native American U.S. conflict, which is honestly some pretty grim stuff, Rory. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it does seem to be um, grim upon grim. And not not a lot of happy stories there. Not a lot of happy stories there. Are, are there any um, happy parts of history you'd like to talk about, like uh, India becoming independent? Well, yes, I, I specifically would talk, like to talk about a uh, very happy film that uh, we've both watched recently. Uh, it might have some darker undercurrents or implications we might tease out uh, during this podcast episode, but uh, RRR, the film that we both watched, a uh, product of not Bollywood, but Tollywood, a different part of the Indian film industry, is one of them. that's a Tollywood epic. It is one of the most delightful films I have ever seen. Like, I don't think, I, I can actually say with with great confidence i haven't had this much fun in a movie theater since i saw kung fu hustle back in like 2004 which is like uh, a similarly just like incredibly high energy incredibly just fun film to watch uh and because rrr actually did kung fu hustle have a dance number oh kung fu hustle had a lot i if i don't recall all the details yes there were definitely dance numbers But it was sort of taking a kung fu movie and then like making it Looney Tunes, like sort of like a Bugs Bunny cartoon, just in terms of the how heightened it was. Uh And it was a really early example of somebody outside of Hollywood doing really incredible stuff with computer graphics. And I would say that RRR, uh, this Tollywood film we're going to talk about today, is is it also an example of that? So. Uh, a little bit about the what's behind it is it seems that this is a combination of two of India's top actors and their top director. And apparently the name is an acronym for all their names put together. Oh, I didn't pick that up. I did not pick that up. Although it's sometimes it's some it's sometimes the start of like one of their surnames and then other time it's like the start of their like second name, so it's a little bit hodgy podgy, but um, and also it does have different meanings in different languages. It's interesting when I the version that I saw in the movie theater in Lower Manhattan is in was in a different language from the Netflix version that I've been going back to check some of my notes on. Yeah, because that one's in Hindi. Mm-hmm. The Netflix version is in Hindi, and then you can get an English dub. I think the original is is Telugu. I I apologize for my pronunciation there, but one of the reasons why this this is such a good film to go f- go through uh, for the More Freedom Foundation uh, is because it is based in the 1920s, and it centers around a very uh, interestingly fictionalized account of. Indian, the Indian struggle for independence against the British Empire, which is definitely a topic that comes up uh, in my work and on this podcast. So it's a running theme. Indeed. Indeed. So we kind of fun. I did as a preliminary before we get into this, before we get into this, we're going to have to talk about Indian history and Indian politics, contemporary Indian politics a lot. And I just want to say at the outset, I have never been to India I've probably read, I don't know, five to 10 books of Indian history or British India history at this point. And, you know, while for most countries that would give me some level of confidence, I think for India, reading five to 10 books is like the equivalent of like reading half a paragraph in a Wikipedia article on a different country. Well, it is a continent of a country with an incredible history. I remember hearing that historically about a third of the world's wealth was in china and another third was in india 
and then that dim, uh, dramatically um, diminished when uh, some Anglo-Saxons popped around. So it is just a, a colossus of history and um, world affairs. There's just so much there, Rory. And what's interesting about there's certainly uh, similar levels of historical depth to China, but in China, there's been a solid 2,000 years of consolidation and sort of filing off the edges and forcing everything into a more consolidated narrative, which can be misleading, but can give you an idea that you have a sense of what China is. Like, India just does not have that. And I want to apologize at the outset. I'm going to mispronounce everything. I'm no doubt going to get uh, historical details wrong. Uh, my interpretations are probably going to be off. But I just want to say that at the outset. I don't know, Rory, I, do you have a deep, uh, deep levels of Indian expertise? I would have less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just at the outset, we, are, we, are, we should acknowledge we are two, uh, two uh, white, Western white fellows uh, who are about to spend an hour talking about uh, a very exciting uh, piece of Indian culture that we may not fully understand and that folks should uh, bear with us on that. May win at the Oscars. Uh, I wouldn't see any reason for it not to. It's uh, pretty extraordinary. So that's what, just in the the foreign language film category or is it nominated with the... I think it might not be. I can't quite... I was trying to double check. I'm not exactly sure what it's up for, but no, I think it might just be on its own terms. Oh, very cool. <laughs> like, oh, was it was the South Korean film Parasite one... one... Yeah, Parasite and stuff. Yeah, yeah. one on its own terms. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's a particular. It's not a particularly competitive field uh, this year. Um, so who knows? It could. It could pull it off. And to be said, you know, I, the people I saw this film with were like half joking, saying, "Well, you know, Hollywood, it's time to hang it up. Like you have been, you have been outdone completely." Um, it really was just people were cheering in the theater, uh, and that's not something I experienced very much uh, outside of sort of Marvel movie opening nights. Um, and I'd say the cheers were much more, they were much louder uh, for this, uh, this Indian product. So I guess without, without further ado, should we, should we get into it? Uh, okay. Well, it, to, the, it starts off with the premise is a small uh, rural Indian village. And we see the British, lots of British soldiers. And they are being sung a song by, you know, a roughly eight-year-old uh, child. And the the wife of the local governor is he? Uh, governor, I think they, they don't specify too much. Yeah, uh, uh, it's he's yes, but he he's high up and he looks evil. And his wife wants this child. She's great at singing, so they are going to take her. And this is where we first see an important line in it. The mother misunderstands what's happening. She thinks she's being paid for the ch child's song, but instead she's being paid for the child. I'm not too sure how much th they're given, but it would appear to be not a lot. Indeed. And so when the mother realizes what's actually happening, she tries to stop the vehicle taking her child away. And one of the soldiers is about to shoot her. And we get an important line that basically the bullets are so expensive. They're m made in England, English metal, shipped all the way to India. And it's, it's far more expensive than an Indian's life is worth. So this is a, a recurring mantra that comes up throughout the film. And this is our first time to see it. Very grim appraisal. I do just want to, I just want to say at the outset that uh, the actor playing the evil British governor is one of my favorite uh, character actors. I think it's his Ray Stevenson, I think his name is, but I will, he's, he, I will always remember him from the HBO series Rome, where he played Titus Pullo. Um, and it's it's great it's great to see him uh, getting some work in a culturally relevant thing though he may not have may not have expected it to be as much of a phenomenon as it has been. But he is a he is a wonderful baddie, possibly one of the best best of the decade. Do you think so far? Oh yeah, he's a great he's a great great bad guy, and he's given uh, great opportunities to just uh, chew up the scenery in this film. It's uh, it's. Uh, he, he seems to be delighting in the opportunity to be as evil a British imperialist as is possible. Uh, the, uh, so then we move from the uh, jungle to introduce the first of our heroes uh, in one of the, it, it, that really sort of 
you know, the, the, the scene in the jungle it's affecting, but, you know, so far so standard. And then you really get a sense of what this film is capable of uh, in the introduction of this character, who is uh, one of our two conflicting leads, who actually works for the British government and seems very ambitious and very interested in working his way up in the British government. And this is actually a historically accurate thing that happened. Uh, one of the... Not quite this way, though. I think they may have taken some artistic liberties. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, unquestionably. But it is a historical fact. Well, the two main characters are based on historical um, people. Yes. They are based on historical people. They are people. two uh, revolutionaries. And to sort of ground the film in a historical uh, action, they talk about how one of the three famous sort of pre-Gandhi, pre narrow leaders of uh, Indian nationalism was arrested. So they, um, the arrest was real. Uh, what comes after that is not, in fact, uh, accurate at all. So we come to a, there. Are, it, it feels like an army barracks, but it's actually a police station that is being besieged by a mob, almost like zombie-esque levels. And they are about to breach the perimeter. They're about to breach the perimeter. And I, you know, I'm sure some of... Yes, it's just people as far as the eye can see. I'm sure some of that crowd was CGI, but I'm also pretty, pretty confident that there were at least hundreds of folks uh, involved in producing... There definitely were a lot of extras. Yeah. Involved in producing what is one of the most epic and absurd fight scenes I have ever seen, which was surpassed within the running time of this three-hour film at least two times. But up to that point, it was the most absurd running fight scene I had ever seen. So what happens is some guy in the crowd throws a rock, smashes the picture of, um, gosh, it was, a, it was a George at that point, whatever the English king in the 1920s was. And, uh, and the, 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 British, uh, the, the British commandant says, oh, arrest that man who's out beyond the barbed wire among this seething mob. And everyone just sort of looks at him nervously and they're not willing to do it until our hero steps up, hops over the uh, fence and goes after him. And he, this guy, it, it's really hard to describe, um, but he essentially is a single handed fist fight or he's got a he's got a wooden stick for a lot of it uh, against a mob of thousands. Well, I think I know a lot of the Indian police to this day do carry a very intimidating stick. But yeah, like a baton stick. That's all he has. But that's all he needs. Apparently. Yeah. See, the, the, this is this is our uh, our hero. You know, I did not. I should have written down the, the names. But apparently this first hero, uh, as with the second hero, is incredibly loosely based on an actual figure and some of the complaints about the film uh, from folks who are more involved in the intricacies here is that uh, this sort of absolute superhero um, uh, nuts and bolts figure here uh, was actually kind of an uppercase uh, guy who was not really getting his hands dirty uh, to this extent. Um, is one of the one of the complaints. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he manages. Sorry, he fights a crowd. He fights an entire crowd and manages to single handedly wrangle uh, this guy and drag him uh, back. And the uh, the English commandant uh, says, "Well, you know, I'm not sure." But he does seem to kill a few people on the way. He kills a lot of people on the way. There's a scene where there's it's like a it's like a rugby scrum have surrounded him, and there's like a sort of small um, cliff face. And he just slowly pushes them, and they all start to fall off this cliff face. To the, it seems like to the point where he can kind of just land on them, so he can fall and be safe. It is quite a, a harrowing. It's hard to know. A lot of people get injured. That is. Certain. I had so much fun at this film, and it, it, it is. But it is worth pointing out that it is an extraordinarily violent film to have as many upbeat dance numbers as it does. You know, it, it's it's quite a. Quite a combination. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of violent death here. I think there's a lot of uh, folks getting visibly devoured by CGI lions uh, in some later scenes. It's uh, there's a lot there's there is a lot of violence here. That is a, an incredible scene. We'll come yeah, to. Indeed, indeed. It's a it's a violent film, and so he's left the this this incredible field littered with corpses. And the the English commandant says, you know, I'm not I'm not sure who I'm who I'm more afraid of, the crowd or him. 
uh, which is uh, a great. Uh, uh, and then we quickly, I think it quickly it goes to uh, the uh, commendations uh, among the uh, British soldiers, British and uh, indigenous soldiers who are working for the British. Yes, immediately they're getting like who are getting the next rank. Yeah, who's getting the special special recognition? And we we quickly see that our hero does not get the special recognition uh, because he. It's all whiteies. Exactly, <laughs> and that now that's actually that that is extraordinarily historically accurate. Uh, there was a yeah, there was an India civil service which was uh, quite prestigious, uh, you know, among uh, the British, uh, highly highly trained, highly highly dedicated, this that and the other thing, and it was a serious fight uh, in you know I can't recall if it was the twenties or the teens or the th even the thirties. It was a serious fight to allow highly quali qualified people of Indian descent to join the India Civil Service. So that, that is very um, something that rang very true uh, about uh, Indian treatment, uh, about British treatment of Indian folks during the empire. So while we do see one hero fight an entire crowd to show how heroic he is, the other one is in a village and we see him fight a wolf and then a tiger to show how heroic he is. Yeah, I got the sense that he they were they were intending to catch uh, catching uh, intending to catch a wolf, but then ended up uh, the the wolf uh, the tiger chases the wolf, so it's you know it adds another level of um, uh, tension. Yeah, uh, and then so they're wanting to catch this, and we're not too sure why at this stage. But he goes, ah, oh, well, I'll take a tiger instead of a wolf. Indeed, it did. And it was another just extraordinary scene. Uh, they're very careful, uh, wisely, uh, at the outset of this film to emphasize with a little uh, blurb saying, just want to tell you that all of the animals in this film are completely CGI. We did not put any... Uh, any actual animals through these tortures, but it, it's a animals in danger. Yeah, I, I guess. Well, I guess it was was there was that Leo Leonardo DiCaprio bear film. I guess that was a lot of CGI there. But just the, I thought this even more than the opening fight scene was just a, uh, an indication of just how bold and uh, impressive the usage of CGI was in this film. Uh, my understanding is it was one of the most expensive Indian films ever made, and and it shows. Well, some bits are a wee bit choppy here. Oh, of course, of course, it's not flawless, but I think there's a part where, oh yes, yes, some of the bit he does a bit of Tarzan swinging is a wee bit meh, but it's strange how some they seem to get a lot of the animal mannerisms down. There's a part later on when it's just like the tiger tries to catch him and just sort of misses, and it just feels. A lot more grounded than Hollywood tends to portray animals. Yeah, I, there's certainly moments with the CGI in this film where it doesn't work, but I think that's the, I think that's an indication of just how ambitious it is. And and then other times it is really good. It's just a, it's, it really just transports you, even when you know you're watching something that is fundamentally ridiculous. It's just got this baseline of sincerity where we're we're watching something that's absolutely impossible and and flatly ludicrous but are completely transported by it it's a really effective film um so they catch the tiger and something that it reminds me of is do you remember the film 300 i do i do and actually zach snyder the director of it's kind of like a more um mythical like this is feels like a portrayal that's been told many times and has been embellished over the years it's not quite the truth but where these two historical um heroes are getting everything embellished as they go but within the film itself it is treated very seriously well it's it's a hyper reality uh, sort of mythological filmmaking oh yes it's almost like a dream and i think that's uh that, that's actually something that Zack Snyder, who's a guy who's reviled in a lot of critical circles, but I actually think is quite interesting as a filmmaker. He, he went from 300 and then he did uh, Watchmen and then he did the uh, not very successful iteration of DC films, Batman versus Superman, uh, Justice League. Um, but what's but his work, you know, wasn't particularly successful, but it was always incredibly interesting. And I really appreciated the Zack Snyder cut. Uh, that uh, HBO paid for, 
Because it, it just, it really let him just go absolutely crazy. And instead of treating superheroes in sort of the same tongue in cheek, vaguely wisecracky way, which, you know, is enjoyable, he really does treat them as if they are mythological figures of, uh, of interesting levels of power and actually uses computer graphics in a more interesting way than I think anybody else in American film does. Um, and I think I, I, I was actually, I was thinking about that Zack Snyder connection to this Tollywood film, Kung Fu Hustle. It's just that that willingness to actually take uh, computer graphics further in the direction, um, myth-making, uh, hyper-reality, not quite, not, not so grounded. I feel like 99% of what we see is trying to make explosions and aliens look more real. And I think what made this film so affecting, what made Kung Fu Hustle all those years ago so affecting, and what, what is most appealing about Zack Snyder's work is that it's not, it's, it's more about making things heightened than it is about making things real. And I think that's very cool. Very, very cool. Well, this is another point where we find out that Beam is ripped. In order to catch the tiger, he has the trap they have kind of breaks, so he has to catch the two bits of rope and squeeze them together to prevent the tiger escaping, which then also causes the rope to break because Beam is so strong. But he manages to uh, subdue it with a magical pot of green something or other. And then and then apologizes to the tiger as to after he has subdued it. Yes, because he's using it for his own means. Which is very interesting. And this is a... Uh, so I read a Vox article that was talking at great length about the problematic... Symbolism? Well, how, just how problematic and like the case-based politics of this, of this film, uh, which, you know... Really, really none of our business, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. But, but I think something worth noting um, is that what's interesting about these figures is so we've got our hero who was beating up the whole crowd. That's uh, A. Rama Raju is, is the historical figure it's based on. And the guy who's in the forest uh, catching tigers is Komaram Beam, or, or Beam is how he's referred to for most of the film. And Raju, Rama Raju, is more of an upper caste uh, figure historically, and Koran Beam is more of a lower caste figure. And in the actual history, this, of course, interplayed with, the act with them as actual historical figures in interesting ways. But the critique that this writer in Vox was making was that in the film, they really play up uh, the idea that Komaran Beam is he's a tribal, he's, uh, I believe it's the, he's of a, people called the Adivasi or something like that, or uh, obviously there's no direct analogs here, but m might be seen as more indigenous or more connected to the land or the ground. And whereas being the historical figure may not have been, you know, coded that way in the film, he's definitely coded as sort of like a tribal and he and his friends are sort of snake charmers shuffling around the forests and seem to be naturally deferential to uh, both the the Rama character and to other folks, and it, it the, the the movie ends with with Beam uh, uh, asking to be taught by Rama Raju, which which is like a, just a very sort of uh, so yeah. I mean, there's aspects of that, but again, that's uh, that's not the aspect of this that I've, I that'll probably be the only time I bring up. I was just going for the obvious thing that the the tiger symbolizes Indian nationalism, the sort of spirit within. Oh, okay. That wants to be free. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. But yeah. And there's another scene at the very start where we see German shepherds, which is like a, you know, a European introduced animal being used to kill native Indian deer. Oh gosh. I'd miss that. That's one of the first things we see. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's, they're not, they're not, they're not subtle. They're not subtle though, with that. But yeah, generally I don't, I don't really need to get, feel that there are so many other issues to comment on. I don't need to get into Indian case politics uh, critique. But I do think that with that introduction, it's sort of worth mentioning uh, that some people feel that the portrayal of Beam in this film is unfair. Is, uh, oh, yes. There's unfair. problems all over the place, I'm sure. Indeed. But there, a lot of them are over our head. Yeah. But we do see a lovely, wonderful baddie who beats the crap out of Beam because he thinks he sabotaged his motorbike. Ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> named Robert, actually. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, this really emphasized over and over and over again. Robert, 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 who is apparently, uh, <laughs> uh, well, because he, he gets multiple opportunities to be aggressive and nasty. Um, yes, and here he seems to go over the top and he 
nearly beats him to death with a like a hose from a motorbike. Well, it just uh, another interesting aspect of this film is that there's there's um, whenever Robert is being brutal and terrible, there is a English woman there to tell Robert to stop. Um, so it just sort of became a refrain of Robert, don't, Robert, don't. Uh, there's sort of some interesting uh, sexual politics uh, in the film uh, around that. Uh, but so, yeah, so Beam, it's established, they're catching tight tigers for some reason. And then that Beam is living in in the city and is working as a mechanic and apparently a pretty good mechanic, which which uh, does contradict the ign- ignorant tribal approach. Has he left the choke on? Is that what happened? It's something incredibly simple. And Robert is like, Beam, what have you done to my motorbike? It won't work. You fixed it yesterday. And Beam just touches it, essentially. And he's like, but he, because he doesn't speak English, he's trying to explain. And Robert is not having any of it and uh, beats him useless to where some random people have to sort of salvage him. And this is explained. The fact that Robert is able to beat him useless is because Beam is undercover. Uh, he and his fellow rebel buddies who have come to the city to to liberate Mali, this... Sort out the Brits. To, yeah, to, to, to liberate this this uh, this girl from the British. Uh, he has to keep a low profile so he couldn't reveal his incredible tiger uh, taming powers. His buffness. Yes, his incredible toughness. Um, so we've established... This is kind of an interesting aspect... It is very interesting, the role of Muslims and Islam in this product. Uh, the, the reason why I think everyone should look at this film with a bit of a jaundiced eye, not enough of a jaundiced eye to not see it. It's a great film. I highly recommend it. Everyone should go give money to it. It's got lots of positive. Oh, aspects. it's highly entertaining. Highly entertaining. Um, and it's great to see. It's just good for world culture that somebody sees this. But it is... Fair, I think, to characterize it as highly Hindu nationalist. Uh, it has very strong definitely uh, elements. Um, he literally, well, he becomes a Hindu god at the end. Indeed, and it's got a really a lot of elements that I think can be tied to the current government in India that is seen by many as very problematic, uh, and by me as well. You know, he's a uh, Modi is a disturbing figure, uh, both uh, on the Indian scene and abroad. He's got a history of um, being pro-Hindu, I think's the term they use. They're not anti-Muslim, but they are pro-Hindu. <laughs> well, and of course, uh, you know, the uh, on his watch when he was the governor of Gujarat, there was a uh, massacre of uh, what, about around a thousand Muslims. Several, it seems. Something like yeah. So well, there was a train incident. There was a, a train that killed a lot of uh, Hindu worshippers, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure if it's known what actually happened. But the rumor is that um, a bunch of uh, Muslims closed all the doors, poured petrol, and and you know did a, a, a terrorist attack essentially. But so this is like the impetus to kill all these uh, Muslims, sadly. Uh, yeah. Reciprocal massacres. Um, I, I think that... Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't think there's any... I think there's that's a highly dubious interpretation of the train um, uh, deaths, And uh, but I don't think there's much... Um, I don't think there's much controversy over the fact that uh, the deaths of these Muslims was, whether it was in response to something or not, uh, was a, a pogrom, was, was quite nasty. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think both the United Kingdom and the EU both uh, agreed with that statement. They did their own investigations. Yeah. Uh, so the, to the degree to which Modi is responsible to the, for that is not something we need to uh, adjudicate here. But he's he's got a grim history. Um, and also, I, I don't want to imply that like this is directly connected to Modi or the BJP, his party. But it's the, it is in the same. This film is very much in the same ideological vein. But it's interesting because the family that he's staying with, that he and his uh, Adivasi uh, visitors from the village to the city are staying with, appears to be Muslim. So I think that... That's what I thought. I assumed I was maybe getting it wrong, but they did uh, come across as Muslim to me, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and I I think it's interesting. The Vox article thought this was very problematic because one of the first things that Beam does... When he, you know, his friendship with the other star of the film, Rama Raju, develops, is he 
he quickly emphasizes that actually I'm not Muslim. I'm just under undercover. And the Vox writer finds this very problematic. But I sort of looking at this, this struck me as a very uh, sort of like 1970s, 1980s sort of Hollywood style treatment of African-Americans or some other minority group where it's like, we're very clear that they're peripheral to the narrative. Um, but we're also saying positive. But they're some way included. But they're good guys. You know, they, they are good guys. So like this does not. And I think one of the reasons why I am still very comfortable recommending this film is that it doesn't strike me as having any particular animus towards Muslims. It does strike me, though, as sort of like cutting them out um, in certain ways. But what I think what the more interesting conflict is the flavor of Hindu mainstream Indian politicians that it chooses to celebrate, which we'll talk about at, at the end. Um, but yeah, that it is it is it is really, really fascinating uh, how that stuff works. Did you notice that little gaff with the um, British Empire map? Oh, well, so how they don't include all of the um, they don't include the princely states? No, worse than that. So it's for it's like a giant. It's nearly like two stories, mm -hmm. three stories high. A giant map of the world with a giant Union mm -hmm. Jack as the background, and everywhere the, that the British Empire owns is with a Union Jack behind it. But according to this, uh, Britain owns Brazil. Oh wow! No, I did. I did not pick that up. I did not pick that up. Yeah, I just thought that was funny. I'm sure there's a couple, a lot more little gaffes about. But this this comes back. A lot is sewed in. So this. Keep an eye on this map because it will come back at the end. Indeed, indeed. Interesting thing is, yeah, there is. So I guess we get to the point that for some reason they've discovered. Oh, no, it's not discovered. There's some informer from the provinces comes in and informs them that, uh, the, informs the British that the guardian of this tribe uh, is has come to take back uh, Molly, the young girl. So they know that they have to be on uh, on watch. They have to look out for uh, look out for these these folks who are coming to try and attack the uh, it's the embassy or the no I guess it wouldn't be an embassy at that point. It would be the the, the government house or what have you. Uh, you know I can't recall. Did they ever specify where in India this was the main city where most of the action takes place? This is also when we get a bit of a love interest, even though there's no uh, kissing involved. So. A female friend interest. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I think traditionally uh, Indian films are a good deal more chaste, right? And the, yeah, I don't think it... Okay. Does anybody... I don't think that... There are certainly... There are two love interests in the film, but does anybody even as much as kiss anybody at any point? I, I don't think I so. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. Um, man, so Beam sees the niece of this, the evil... The two evil... Um, governor and governess i guess and he f seems to fall madly in love even though they both don't speak the same language indeed well because she has shown kindness uh to laborers uh in it, it's a big theme of uh this film is english women uh deterring uh brutal uh english men from beating uh indian men and women with the exception of course of the governoress the, the governor's wife who is Quite sadistic, quite sadistic, which we, which we may or may not have time to get into. I, Very Corella de Vil-esque. I, I really, we've, we've got to pick up the pace. I feel like yeah. we've been doing this for half an hour and we're, we're barely at the, you know, our two heroes haven't even met. So it's established. We are keeping in time with the film, it seems. <laughs> but yes, we'll go on to the first bit where our, our two main heroes meet and they don't even need to talk. They both know we're two buff guys. We're going to sort out the Brits. So is it Raj? He um, there's a child in peril because a train full of oil has exploded, and Raj sees Beam across the bridge, and they can, and he starts to do sign language as if to say, "I'm going to jump off one side of the bridge with a piece of rope, and you'll jump over the other, and they will catch each other with a, an early version of the Indian flag." And he gets everything. He gets it all. It, it, that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. So apparently, if you're just a certain kind of hero. You, you you not only um, can instantly identify each other, you know, uh, hundreds of meters away from each other, you know, from a bridge and standing on the bank, you are apparently also largely fluent in, I guess, sort of uh, 21st century special operator 
yeah, yeah, hand, hand gestures. gestures. Uh, this app, this comes up a couple of times and it's hilarious both times because they just instantly, having never met each other, instantly understand exactly what they're going to do. Uh, and exactly what they're going to do is the most... Because jumping off a bridge with a motorbike and a horse is what's involved. Yes, the most convoluted uh, uh, plans imaginable. Uh, it's hard to even describe, so, what, so they have to save this kid. But we also see our theme of the one character is represented with fire mm -hmm. and the other is with water. Ah, yes. And here we have fire and water meeting and they have to work together yeah. to save the innocence of India. There you go. There you go. You, you, you've got to go to deep, deep <laughs> grasp of the, the metaphorical language here, Rory, that I'm missing. Even though they're on both sides so one could symbolize the native indians and others could symbolize people working with the british they have to set their differences aside well it's probably sort of unity across caste you know as sort of the you can have your uh, and this is the way that he's portrayed the most ignorant of lower caste uh, tribals being able to work directly with a upper caste guy and they also high five underwater yes they do high five underwater <laughs> because why not the the british are looking for this one man who I think looks weirdly like modern day Haley Joel Osmond. Haley Joel Osmond. Wow, that's uh, that is not something I jumped to. Uh, he was in the he was on the Boys, and yeah, he is. He's in Silicon Valley, and it just yeah, he was on the Boys, and I'm he hasn't he he hasn't aged well. He has he has not aged well. He was a very cute kid. I think he's not too bad considering considering child actors. A lot of child actors do not grow up well. Uh, Haley Joel Osmond has you know just sort of. Looks like a schlubby dude. He's just filled out. He's loving life. Yeah, he's loving life. He's loving life. Uh, it's interesting. You know, so I, we, we should point out that before this action scene where they m met each other, it's established that uh, Rama, our, our quite militant uh, pro-British, uh, supposedly militant pro-British. Supposedly. Yes. Uh, we should have given a spoiler alert here, but it, it's pretty obvious. Uh, supposedly uh, pro-British. Um, guy uh, has realized that to become the special officer, that Beam is the guy he's going after, and they just so he's 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 searching the city. They become best buds and are unaware that they are on different sides. And there's this just incredible montage of them becoming best friends after their underwater high five. Uh, and the the lyrics, uh, I think every review has pointed to this, but they are the most on-the-nose lyrics imaginable. It's like, will their friendship end? It reminds me of, have you ever seen Black Dynamite? I've never seen Black D uh, Dynamite. It has a soundtrack that basically says exactly what's happening and what is about to happen. Yeah, it's, it's like, will their friendship end in violence? No one can know. They are the they are the embodiments of instinct and nature. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not subtle stuff, um, but it's also... As with everything in this film, it's, it's not a subtle film, so it fits it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely filmmaking from a different time. Uh, we have buddy films in the uh, United States, of course, but everything, uh, I feel like interestingly, as we become, even as we've become in some ways less homophobic as a culture, like everything about a buddy film is sort of wrapped in layers of like, fear around gay panic or like appearing weird well there's something red letter media coined which is if you have a buddy film you have to have a scene of the not gays where you show them with girlfriends so you can go see they're not gay it, not really a concern uh in this film uh if you just if you watch it from the um uh, with the jaundiced view of, you know, maybe we're getting maybe we're getting a little bit beyond it uh, in the 2020s, but sort of the jaundiced view of a 2010s uh, viewer of Hollywood films. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that's like, whoa, they're riding on a bike together and like stuff that sort of, you know, would 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 send a uh, Hollywood script writing room from the 2000s into uh uh, a feverish uh -huh. uh, rush of writing in not gays or what have you. But, you know, they, they're just really into being pals. And they do a big, like, what seems to the Western eye almost romantic montage of how much fun they're having being pals. And it's, you know, it's it's fun as hell. Um, oh, we do get a, an incredible epic dance-off. Yes, yes. Also uh, related to the wooing of the uh, em uh, the ambassador's niece. So although Beam isn't able to talk to her, 
Uh, Jenny invites them to like a big swanky do with all the honkies. Mm-hmm. This leads to so there's a smarmy guy Jenny's with who knows all the dance moves except one. Do you know what dance move that is? Uh, I don't actually. I forget the name of it. I was hoping you're going to remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the uh, it's interesting because they call it something different in the Hindi version from oh, okay. what they call it in the Tollywood version. And it is known, and I think it's totally worth, especially if you've only watched the Netflix version or if you're never going to watch anything related to this film ever, just going to YouTube and uh, Googling Natu Natu. It's the Natu Natu song. It's N. That's it. He doesn't know the Natu Natu dance. He doesn't. And I think it's he knows a, tango, but not Natu Natu. Indeed, I think it's N A A T U N A A T U. Uh, and yeah, it, it really gives a sense of this whole film, uh, and might help you enjoy this podcast a little better if uh, you just uh, watch that clip. And it really gives you a sense of just how deliriously... Yeah, I think that whole scene is on YouTube. Oh, yeah. In 4K. Yep. In 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 uh, Telugu. I apologize. I know I'm pronouncing that. Uh, which is the, the language of Tollywood in Andhra Pradesh. Uh-huh. Or uh, is it in... Uh, well, it's in Hyderabad, which is apparently not actually in Andhra Pradesh, but is actually the capital of Andhra Pradesh. Man, I got to tell you, I did so much research after... Uh, watching this film, and that's one of the the great um, just joys and horrors of attempting to study India is that I spent probably you know, twelve hours just sort of diving through stuff off of this film, and it has all just gone in, you know, one eye and out the other. Like I, I just there's just you know, it's just oh yeah, so much. such a vast amount. Yeah, there's just so much. But uh, I would highly recommend, and that's that's another amazing thing about this film. It's a satisfying violent action film with absurd set pieces and then you know occasionally there's just a big dance number um yes where we see a smarmy english guy get out danced indeed and then we see the caste system is it's possible that the caste system is going to turn on each other mm-hmm. but instead um raj chooses to uh, fall over so beam looks good in front of jenny indeed it's all it's all <laughs> but it, it is it is an epic uh, dance number Absolutely epic. And I think it's worth it's worth saying uh, this is a great it's it's fun just the wide range of ways that this film just beats up on the British. You know, they they can't they can't fight, they can't run the place, they can't even dance. And it's it's just fun. It's it's one of the things I really enjoyed about this film is just to see the British Empire sort of occupying the space that is usually occupied by, like, Nazis or the Russians in Hollywood films. Oh, definitely. Well, the British do make great baddies. Yeah, they make such... Well, the horrible thing is they portray them as cartoonishly evil, and you're sort of going, no, no, they were kind of worse. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's the terrifying thing. Yeah, you look... Obviously, certain things are played up for uh, effect. There probably weren't, you know, that many figures who were as cartoonishly consistently evil as Robert the uh, the Martinet or the 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 horrific governor and his wife um, but all of the individual actions are things that happened and worse things happened um, it, it's it's uh, it was really nasty and from the perspective of the Indians you know the British Empire were the Nazis yeah absolutely and they did, didn't the British invent eugenics? It wasn't a five-year thing. It was a, yeah, it wasn't a five-year thing. It was a 200-year thing. Yeah, it's, um... But we do have a scene where Beam is grounded later on because he finds his, we find out it's his sister, isn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Or she's his sister and... The, the, the girl who's been abducted is his sister. Yeah. Yes. She's in a house, but it's like a very posh, fancy house, but there's still like an iron gate to keep her here. Mm -hmm. So Beam finds her on the other side of the gate and we see Robert running about. But thankfully, Robert doesn't catch him, but he basically says, I'll be back. Mm -hmm. I can't save you currently, but don't you worry, I have a plan. And my goodness, I did not... uh, What a plan. What a plan. What did you think of it? It's an am- it is an amazing plan. It is an amazing plan. I do want to say, though, before we get to this extraordinary plan, 
I, I saw this incredible detail on Wikipedia, so I'm not sure if it's true, but apparently they filmed the whole Not To Not To dance movement and this extraordinary plan that we're about to get to was filmed in the presidential palace in Kiev, Ukraine. Wow. In 2021, apparently. <laughs> uh, okay, I, just, I did I, not know that. I, I was... I did not know that either, uh, and I almost wonder if, gosh, you know, if, if that's fake, uh, I honestly have respect. I'll need to check that after. Yeah, yeah. That, it's very possible. Yeah, I mean, it's... They do fill them all around the world. Editing Rory here. It is true. The palace used in the film is the Ukrainian presidential palace. It's an impossibly garish uh, building, and that, that makes sense. You know what I think? Yeah, Yan- Yanukovych? Oh, I always mispronounced that guy's name. Um, but yes, the plan is honestly something that I have probably rewatched on YouTube 15 times since I watched this film, uh, on Thursday night. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's quite something. Would you like to do the honors, Rory? Well, we were talking about Jihad last week and there was a part where we removed the likes of suicide bombers. We thought it was a bit insensitive, but back in the 1920s, Explosives were hard to come by, so you had to just round up all the animals you could and then let them loose at a big fancy dinner. Yeah, so it's... So then we also find out why Beam was capturing the tiger from the beginning of the film. Yes, so this is absolutely a tiger bomb. Uh, the, the visuals of this are actually very... If you're talking about uh, just the sense of uh, conflict in the Middle East or whatnot, it's certainly resonant. Uh, you've got a big party in a compound. Uh, these guys drive up in a truck. They smash through two sets of gates. Uh, this is very resonant uh, for uh, many of the largest casualty events uh, in the Middle East over the past 40 years or so. Uh, but instead of a ton of explosives, it is cages full of tigers. Uh, that 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 the the truck... tigers, wolves, deer, bears, yep, jaguars, everything. I think there's a gorilla. Isn't there a gorilla? No, I don't think there's a gorilla. I thought there was a gorilla. Anyway, so they I think it's all like native Indian animals. Um, so he, he he you know the 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 truck comes squealing in, uh, you know, and as it's breaking, the the tarp is dropped, and our hero beam. Uh, in full war paint with torches, jumps off of this truck with these lions and tigers and bears behind him. And it is one of the coolest things I have ever seen. Uh, And then the... It is definitely epic. There's also a point where he throws a jaguar at someone, or sorry, a leopard. Yep, definitely. That definitely happens. (laughs) Definitely happens. I love how he's just like, um, you're not supposed to attack me, and he just throws them at a Brit. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And uh, oh, it's outstanding. Yeah. And then I think at this point we have our big battle between uh, the great friends yes. who have now realized that they are on opposite sides. Well, they, he also gets revenge on Rob at this yes, point, does he Yes, yes. Rob, my namesake, uh, is, uh, gets his, get, finally gets his ass handed to him. But Rob is terrible at fighting. He, Yeah, he doesn't put up any sort of fight and Beam just destroys him. But yes, the two sides of Indian society go at they it. They do. I mean, just an incredible. There's, I get they're, they're like using chains and like fountains to fight each other. It's quite, it's quite something. Uh, well, because it's to symbolize the fire and the water again. Got it. You know, you're way ahead of me on this. The the symbolic land drug share. So Beam has like hoses full of yes. water. Yes. Yep. I recall that now. Yeah. Oh, they're fire and they. Oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. Fire and water. It, uh, it, it, also, very traditional, you know, this, one of the things that I think helps this film resonate so much uh, with American audiences, we should mention it's it's tremendously successful. I think it is the most successful uh, Indian film in, uh, in the United States of all time at this point. But one of the reasons it does that. Okay. I think it's currently big in uh, Japan. I think it's big everywhere. This is a great, it's a great movie. Um, but one of the reasons that it works is that it's also very good about sticking to sort of international action movie tropes, which is just the tremendous amount of abuse that our two lead characters take over the course of this film. Uh, you know, uh, you know, stabbed, burnt, exploded, uh, poor Beam. There's an extended sort of Braveheart style sequence where Beam is, is publicly tortured. Um, and they all seem 
there's one wee thing I like about that scene. Sorry, um, basically the building that gets stormed with the um the the zoo full of um hatred because the door is broken in that scene the door is like a patchwork of just like random planks i just thought that was a nice little touch huh. interesting the uh but but they take an incredibly am- incredible amount of abuse and just keep bouncing back and that's very that's a very standard international action movie trope they they just invincible these characters so Beam is Beam is so Beam fails. He does not he, uh, publicly flogged. He fails. He, he because his his friend has to betray him, and uh, Beam is captured, and we now learn why Ramaraju has been so enthusiastic in going in service to the British Empire because he actually and this is after. So it turns out he is he is from his own village. Indeed, and he has. So we learn this. It's <laughs> this is something I haven't seen in a uh, U.S. film for quite some time. It's actually probably something that James Cameron could uh, take uh, would benefit from. Is there was an actual intermission in this film, um, and it is after the intermission that we have an extended sequence, a flashback sequence to uh, Rama Raju's uh, childhood in a village where the entire village is being trained uh, as a resistance force against the British. And we learn what happens when, uh, and his father apparently is a, was a highly placed British soldier who was, uh, who became incredibly disillusioned because of the brutality of the strangely immortal uh, governor figure who uh, was uh, was there to deliver again his his monologue on how uh, Indian uh, Indian person uh, is not worthy of a British bullet. I think it's the second time we get this quote and this is this is actually in a flashback to a flashback because we get Ramuraju's father's uh, time as a soldier backing up the governor when he gives this speech and uh, murders a village elder with a hammer. Or uh, because he's not worth a bullet, and this is apparently the inciting incident that causes Ramaraju's father to become this insurgent leader who's drilling this village on how to become an insurgent. Uh, we should probably rush through this, I guess. Um, so there's a very affecting uh, sequence uh, where the young Ramaraju, as a as a boy, uh, with his father manages to hold off an invading British force. Uh, it's, it's very impressive, but what happens is the Indians, the Indian insurgents lose because they just simply don't have enough weapons. So Ramaraju has sworn to, sworn to his dying father, his very dramatically dying father, uh, that he will procure the weapons necessary. And we learn that Ramaraju's entire career with the British military has been in order to get into the position where he has control over weapons shipments so he can get those guns to his village. And betraying Beam, betraying his best friend, is how he finally gets into that position where he can finally get his village the guns they need. Yes. Um, So it's all very, all very dramatic. We do have a montage. It's nearly like... It's like if you had a grounded reality version of the scene out of The Matrix where he goes, guns, lots of guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he just walks into the British like um, barracks and it's just him with all the guns. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really quite, quite an extraordinary film. Um, so we learn that Ramaraju decides... After this really extended uh, uh, vision of torture, uh, Ram Raju has to f- publicly flog his his dear friend Beam in front of the governor and the governor's sadistic wife, um, who contributes her own really nasty whip uh, that has uh, uh, barbs on it. Yes, um, nails in it. It kind of looks like it's studded with nails. It's fascinating because this is um, this is something that I don't associate with India, and I think that this this whole 
narrative of insurgency, this narrative of uh, blood and struggle is not something that I generally associate with India. And I'm fully conscious that that could be unfair to a degree because it's a uh, it's an image of India of the nonviolent victory, the um, uh, the non-aligned, the sort of being more spiritually above this kind of you know power mad approach to things. Um, and I'm sure that's an image that was sort of inaccurate, but that is an image of India that this film and quite possibly modern India is no longer interested in. And I think that's, I think that's fascinating because especially with this flogging sequence, okay. it's like, it's, it's so Braveheart, right? Oh, definitely. Like it's, it's, it's so, it's so Mel Gibson. It is very much sort of Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which is, gosh, you know, I guess it's old enough now that I have to uh, give a, a, a quick uh, synopsis. It's essentially the the story yeah, of well ninety four. I think it came out. Yeah, it's the story of Scottish the Scottish fight for independence against the English. And there's this really extended sequence at the end of it where Braveheart is uh, viciously tortured and executed. Mel Gibson famously, uh, you know, he made the Passion of the Christ. He loves blood. He just loves blood. He made a World War Two. His big comeback uh, film. Uh, after the anti-Semitism uh, scandal, his sort of decade of the wilderness, he made a big World War II comeback film that was adored and honestly made me nauseous. It was so violent. Um, so it, it's just that wow. it's very uh, Heartbreak Ridge or something like that. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to see on a range of levels, this keeps coming back, just that vision of the Indian insurgents training up so that they can violently take power back um, from the British. It's just not something that's part of my image as a Westerner looking in of Indian independence. Well, because it's all almost seen as if like the Brits just went, oh, okay, and it was a peaceful handover. Well, I wouldn't, I, no, I actually, so I actually... Not that extreme. No, I don't see it that way. I, I do see it as... A very positive thing in that Gandhi um, and the power of nonviolence in the United States were really, really wrapped up in Gandhi's example um, because it was seen as inspiring Martin Luther King um, and inspiring the resolution to the extent that we've had a resolution to civil rights for African Americans in the United States. So in the United States, there's this vision of Gandhi didn't need to be violent because of the power of his persuasiveness, the power of his uh, spiritual power. And I think that in the earlier decades of Indian power, I mean, really up until uh, I think the Congress Party still largely goes for this, um, that image of spiritual superiority and Gandhi's being able to, to beat the most powerful empire the world had ever seen with, with pure spiritual power and the power of nonviolence and peace and, and self-determination um, is really attractive to me as an outsider. Maybe subconsciously it's attractive to me as sort of an imperialist who, who likes the idea of not having to die for, um, you know, for the power that I've exerted. But, but also I think it, you know, it, it, it was a message that re resonated legitimately and had tremendous positive effects um, but it's up to the Indians to decide what kinds of national visions they want. And this film very much presents a national vision that is different, uh, from that old Gandhi peace, nonviolence. Uh, we, you know, the, through the power of our arguments and our virtue, we forced the British out nonviolently. That is an image of Indian nationalism or Indian power that this film has no interest in. And it is much more interested in a sort of Mel Gibson, we, you know, we took these weapons from the British and we killed them with their own weapons. Um, it's a very Mel Gibson, it's very Braveheart, it's very, you know, I think what I find vaguely disappointing about this, again, it's not for me to decide how Indians choose to define themselves, is that 
I did see this as superior. I saw this Indian, this vision of Indian power as superior to the way most nations in the world define themselves. Um, and I think a lot of Hindutva, um, the sort of ideology of Modi, uh, people complain about it at great length, mostly because they're disappointed because it is kind of a falling away from like a higher ideal, but it's, it's a falling down to everybody else's level is what it is. Like everybody, most everybody in the world defines their nationalism in this way, battles for independence, um, you know, violent power, being able to be strong enough to crush the people who tried to crush us. Um, I think it's, I think it's something to be lamented that, you know, this sort of more Gandhian peaceful view seems to be fading away from India. But I also think it was kind of ridiculous for everybody to just sort of expect India to hold itself to a higher standard than everybody else in the world. So, sorry, that's my rant on that topic. But the, but yeah, I think from this point in the film, it really emphasizes that this is about India violently turning the tables on the British and beating the British their own violent game, which is makes for an awesome film. Uh, uh, F the British, especially in the context of British India. Like, yeah, it's great. It's fun. It's nice to, it's nice to finally see movie bad guys that aren't just speaking with British accents. They're actually British. Um, you know, cause you know, it's funny cause all the Russians and the Nazis and all the, all the action films are usually speaking with British accents. Um, so it's it, but there is, I think something to be lamented here a little bit. Um, does that make sense? Oh, definitely. That is something I came across. There wasn't any sort of, um, negotiation with them. It is just, yeah, we'll just get the bullets and beat them at their own game. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that is not in fact. And there also is a suicide bombing at one point as well. Which is, uh, I don't know if it was the most tasteful. I don't recall the suicide bombing. Do you remember that part? No, I don't. Do you remember his father? Oh, yes. This is in the Rama Raju flashback. Basically, he, when we find out he is actually uh, wanting to overthrow the British as well. They don't have any guns apart from one, which is his father's. And we see montages of them constantly training with wooden guns. And eventually the British come to basically kill a lot of them because they think they're revolting the father has destroyed that a huge number and then the son does the same so the father says look i'll give myself up when they ask for me and then he, he's basically full of explosives and it's like son shoot me so he shoots him killing himself and all the british soldiers in the process well, i think that was very i think that was kind of effective and fits the theme of the film because it shows how dedicated rama is to his mission that he will that he will kill his own father uh, in order to take out some more British. Um, I, I think it is worth emphasizing that that this is not the the what we see towards in in the second half of the film, and as we'll, we'll, we will run through very quickly at this point because we've been doing this for over an hour already. Um, is we see a violent overthrow of uh, the British, and uh, to be clear, that's not that's not actually what happened. There were elements. Uh, in the vast Indian nationalist sphere is really wide range uh, of folks, as one would expect in a country with the diversity of India. Um, but the folks who actually did beat the British and take over from the British were folks like Nehru and Gandhi. And the process of India, well, and Jinnah, of course, uh, the process of Indian independence was spectacularly violent but it was not violent against the British. It was uh, intercommunal violence between Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and other varieties um, within India itself. And that's, of course, how we got partition between India and Pakistan. So, you know, again, like I can see why India would want a cleaner and more satisfying vision of Indian independence. Uh, of just uh, uh, Indians, you know, violently overthrowing uh, the terrible oppressor that was a terrible oppressor, whereas in actual fact, in 1947, it was sort of uh, Mountbatten, the last viceroy, just sort of sitting around having drinks with Nehru. I think, I think, pretty sure Nehru was sleeping with his with Mount the British governor's wife, but uh, you know, sitting around having drinks with Nehru, being oh, it's very sad that these hundreds of thousands of people are killing each other. 
um, before the, the, the British flew out with full military honors. Um, so yeah, it's a fantasy. Uh, it's, uh, but you know what? Top Gun is a fantasy. Um, I think that uh, RRR is, uh, you know, a very much a hyper-nationalist piece of filmmaking, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, Top Gun is a hyper-nationalist uh, type of filmmaking, you know, pretty much providing a justification for an imperialist war uh, against Iran, as I've talked about in some other places. So uh, I would say that RRR, whatever sinister aspects it has, is significantly less sinister than, say, Top Gun. Uh, so it's kind of hard to... Mm -hmm. he here endeth my complaining, is what I'm saying, until we get... if. Until we get to the last dance sequence, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll complain again at the end there. But we do also get the um, the recurring line about how expensive the bullets are it does come back at the end. Indeed. When the governor is basically... Well, I thought there was going to be more of a showdown. He can't... We do miss a... We, there's an amazing part we do miss where... Does the car get bombed or does it crash? And as he's mid-air, he just reaches for his gun... Yes. <laughs> Fires it yes. at one of our heroes, which then blows him into a head. There's a lot of... So it's expecting... There's also a part where they jump on each other's shoulders and become a mech. Yes. So I thought we were going to have them have to both fight to beat him, but they pretty much just shoot him and then quote the line, oh, we have to give you back the bullet, yeah. British man. It's awfully expensive. You couldn't waste it on us Indians. So they shoot him. And the blood splatters all over the map where it says the British Empire. Indeed. Which we've seen from earlier in the film. It, it, so the whole second half of the film is this sort of hyper-violent, just sort of orgy of uh, torture and blood and violence. And it's so much fun. Um, and uh, it, well, for, you know, so Beam has been captured we have this public flogging scene, and then Rama Raju decides, you know what, screw it, he's my friend. I'm going to try and do both. I'll try and get the weapons from my village, but I'm also going to set him free. And this is a very long sequence of battle. Uh, and he, get, he frees Beam, but Beam doesn't actually realize he's on his side. So there's a little more fighting there. And then Raju ends up being extensively tortured uh, by the governor in this sort of thing. And then... Beam runs into Rama Raju's long last love and she tells him the truth and he then dashes back to free him from a prison camp where we get and then really it's got to be a solid 40 minutes from that prison camp until the governor finally getting it and it's just a absolute mayhem. A three hour film with credits. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I don't think we could really do justice uh, with the play by play uh, there. Well, well, there's also a, there's a, a callback to the very beginning. Do you remember when they're talking about the, um, you know, this, uh, this small village and it's saying, what are they going to take on the British uh, Empire with a bow? And that's exactly what happens at the end. With, but also, the, some of those bows have uh, grenades attached. Yep. And with some of that, just that, that they do that incredible thing where they just they just instinctually uh, know how to do like special operator U.S. Special Forces hand signals uh, to do the most ridiculous things. And it's uh, that's where they came from. Did you not, do you not know that? Role? Oh, yeah, they're 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 both Rama Rama Raju and uh, Koran Beam are, are, are. Yeah, they taught the Americans special forces how to do it. Ah, they're, they're, they're JSOC veterans. That's that's not surprising. So yeah, it's uh, it's quite a film. I would highly, highly recommend it. And it's on Netflix, from what I can tell, so it's probably the easiest place to see it. If you can see it in a theater, I would recommend doing so. I do think that the uh, te Telugu, again, I pause it for pronunciation, the, the Telugu pronunciation is, uh, I think, what it was initially broadcast in. Um, yeah. So the, even the Hindi version is a dub. And honestly, the experience of seeing this film in a theater with a crowd of more than three uh, is is quite a lot of fun because everybody's just completely losing it the entire time, cheering. It's it's quite quite worth your time. I would highly, highly recommend that. Okay, brilliant. I do want to talk about the last dance number is incredibly bubbly and fun. And this day, another thing. And then you like look at the lyrics, and it's like I think the main you know uh, fly the flag to which we have given our lives. It's it's very dissonant. It, it, the the words and what's being expressed 
And actually a lot of the visuals. And lots of these like um, early Indian flags being flown. Yes. Uh, and I think there's something specific about that Indian flag that I was not able to track down. But I believe that version of the Indian flag is coded as more nationalist uh, for some reason. But, okay. but just the visuals of this last, you could write a dissertation on the ending dance sequence because it's very happy, it's very bubbly, and the lyrics are just very, uh, they're like the lyrics of a national anthem. They're just very violent, they're very blood-centered. Uh, the visuals behind them are all about guns, just the, the fixation on guns in the... Well, there's also cannons in it as well. Yep, yeah, cannons, guns. The fixation on guns in the whole second half of this film and in this last final happy bubbly dance sequence is... Guns will set you free. Yeah, it's, it's quite... It is, it is not my vision, uh, the vision of India that I am accustomed to. It's also very interesting, the figures that they select, at, at, at certain points, the heroes of the film, uh, including uh, one of the romantic leads, will sort of say, and these people are in our hearts forever. And you have figures of Indi significant figure Indian political figures. And Nehru, the founding prime minister, is not there. Um, so there are, of course, no Muslim no Muslim figures are there. Um, I don't really agree with the, I think it would be kind of strange even for the old school Congress Indian folks to like have Jinnah up there. I mean, he's, you know, the head of Pakistan, the country that, you know, every Indian political party has been fighting against for the past uh, 70 years. I think that criticism is a little off base, frankly. But the fact that Nehru, the high case Hindu guy, um, who was the first Indian prime minister and oversaw the independence of India, is not there. Gandhi, the you know heroic figure of Indian independence, is not there. Yes, <laughs> and it's, it's it is very it lines up very closely with figures that um, Hindu nationalists are interested in, uh, specifically uh, Subhas Chandra Bose. I'm sure, I mispronounced that. I apologize who was a highly placed uh, figure in the Indian National Congress in the lead up to independence, but why he is significant, and I think why he is so significant for this film, is that he is the most significant figure of armed resistance to the British Empire. He is very unpopular, okay. very unpopular uh, with the British, with the Americans in the West more generally, because he took arms against the British Empire by allying with the Japanese during World War II. Uh, so he is uh, certainly portrayed, I don't know, I'd probably unfairly, as a fascist uh, in uh, the United States because he was willing to cozy up to the Nazis and the Japanese if it would help him free his country. Uh, I think that, that even today that makes us in the West sort of squirm a little bit, but but I mean, should it honestly? I mean, didn't didn't the Finnish uh, cozy up with the Nazis to throw out the Russians, and we've made our peace with that, right? Um, I think it's uh, it's entirely natural for Bose to be a more celebrated figure, but it is so strange that that is it's, I guess not so strange, but it is very different for him to be the figure that they are celebrating. The second figure that they show after uh, Supas Chandra Bose is uh, Vallabhai Patel. And he's interesting because that's, uh, this is, could be oversimplifying dramatically, but I think I'm accurate in saying this, that Vallabhai Patel is the guy that they want, that the BJP, the party of the current Indian Prime Minister Modi, kind of wants to replace Gandhi with. Um, he's a figure who worked with Gandhi, but what his position is, he was sort of a Hindu nationalist strongman. And what he's credited with is uniting all of India uh, in the aftermath of the British leaving. Because, and this is something that, that is uh, alluded to in the beginning, I thought this is what you were talking about with the British map, is there's a big British map of India uh -huh. that I think is I in the building when um, Ra uh, Rama Raja is being given his assignment to go after Beam. Yeah. Um, and it's got a, a map of British India, but it doesn't include most of the princely states. So when the British ran India, they directly administered a lot of it. 
But then especially after 1857, they outsourced it to rajas and princes and sultans and what have you. So there, it, was like a, it was like a Swiss cheese sort of map. And Vallabhai Patel, the second figure that they choose to idolize and the end credits of this film, is the figure who is credited with browbeating all these rajas and sultans into signing over their jurisdictions to the Indian government. So the BJP apparently has built, I think it's the largest statue in history. Wow. Of Vallabhai Patel. And uh, so it's, it's just, it's very interesting. Uh, I read a book recently that was sort of just talking. It was just like, I'm not even going to attempt to write a coherent history of India. Uh, I'm just going to write a series of biographies. Um, and it really is interesting how different political figures in India have such a wide range of political figures to pick from that they can construct their own preferred nationalist ideology. And it is worth pointing out that the preferred nationalist ideology of this film, um, and you know, it's a film that ends with a massive dance number waving Indian flags, so I think it is fair to talk about the nationalist ideology of this film, um, is one that eschews nonviolence. It is one that makes India more of a normal country um, and not one with some elevated spiritual Gandhian nonviolent path, which is, you know, I guess not something we need to expect from India, but it is uh, it is something to be lamented, I think. I think. What do you think? I, I think you're right. There didn't seem to be any. Um, do they try for uh, peaceful negotiations in any way? Obviously, they do say, oh, please, can we have the child back and stuff? But after that, it's like, well, time to get the guns and the tigers. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not so concerned about the narrative. I mean, it's a fairy tale, you know, it, it's uh, the, the. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Evil of the governor and the wife are, it was not something that could have been negotiated with. But just for it to be so, so gun oriented, so nationalist oriented, and just very clear about which kinds of nationalism are palatable and attractive. I don't know. I enjoyed the film. Everybody should go see the film. Hmm? Or, yeah, good nationalism. I don't know if it was good nationalism. I think it's certainly worse nationalism than India used to have, but but no worse than any other country's nationalism. So can't can't really blame them for it. As far as I'm concerned, any any final thoughts? A wonderful film that may lead to a troublesome future for India. Well, I think the the the, the it is a a symptom uh, of a p potentially more troubling future in current politics uh, uh, for India. I don't think we can we can quite blame our art. And I, I think it's worth pointing out a lot of um, a lot of the reviews were careful to point out that this is. This is a lot of what is produced in Bollywood and Tollywood and other uh, uh, film industries within uh, India. I mean, it's what's so strange about this is that this has perhaps inadvertently, I'm sure every filmmaker would like their film to become an international phenomenon, but it, it's there are many, many films with politics like this and with politics that are much, much worse than this film. Uh, but this is the film that is becoming an international phenomenon. And it's funny because, you know, prior to this decade, the films that I associated with India were like the films of uh, Satyajit Rai, uh, like Pathar Panchale, which are just sort of sad, slow films about poverty. Um, and you know what? If, if, if it were my country, I, I think I'd be happier having my country being represented by RRR than by sad, slow films about rural poverty, you know? And I think uh, we can agree on that. Indeed, indeed. The More Freedom Foundation is also available on YouTube and TikTok. Rob's Twitter is Rob Law, and he's also written a book called Avoiding the British Empire, What It Was and How the US Can Do Better. And music provided by Kevin MacLeod. <laughs>